All right. It is time for us to get started. So welcome everyone to Canberra's Zero Waste Festival 2020. We're so excited to be here with you this evening and a very special evening it is with our keynote speaker, Jackie French. I wish to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, traditional owners of the land on which I'm coming to you today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the contribution that Ngunnawal culture makes to this beautiful city of Canberra and this lovely region that we live in. Look, thank you so much for making time to join us today to talk about zero waste. Jackie has an incredible story to tell. It's going to be so exciting. Um, Jackie French AM is an author, ecologist, historian, honorary wombat part-time, of course, senior Australian of the year in 2015, Australian Children's Laureate 2014 to 15, and ex-echidna milker, amongst many other things. Jackie will share her story with you this evening on Zero Waste and she'll share reflections on the way lives have changed over the last 50 years. She'll talk with us about the practical ways that she reduces waste in her home and garden and she'll inspire you to look at your own life from clothes to holidays to see if these escapes uh, from reality are really um, our escapes from the reality of that connection between humans and the environment. So I'm really looking forward to this evening. We'll have, Jackie will speak for, you know, for the first period of time, and then there'll be some space for you to ask questions. Um, in terms of the, the um, technology, you can use the Q&A function um, just on the bottom of your screen to ask questions of Jackie. And um, we'll, you can like questions. So if you see a question there that you think is fantastic, you can like it, and then it'll get towards the top of the pile faster and so it's much more likely to be answered if that question has been liked. Um, also just a couple of other housekeeping things for us this evening. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Zero Waste Revolution. We're just a small Canberra-based community group. There's just you know half a dozen of us. We're completely volunteer run and all, we're passionate about inspiring the Canberra community um, and beyond to take the next step towards their zero waste journey, wherever that might be. It might be about sorting your recycling and it could be about um, getting that last little bit of plastic out of your life. So we're passionate about meeting people where they're at and supporting them to take that next practical step. And that's what this festival is all about. Practical ideas to inspire change, taking that next step towards zero waste. Um, we're recording. So just need to let you all know that we're recording and we will publish that recording on our Facebook site at some point um, in the near future. Um, and I think that is about all. So without anything further, I'd like to introduce Jackie French. The, I mean, I did give you a bio before, but you are the one, the only, the amazing Jackie French. We are so honoured to have you as our headline keynote speaker um, this evening. And I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Okay, Ab absolutely no pressure then to be interesting. Um, I'd like to pay my in fact, love and gratitude to the elders present and past and future of the land on which I speak. Um, the land of the Durga and the Avaluan people of the UN nation with much love and much gratitude. I'm old enough to remember a time before waste. Um, it's actually more than 50 years. It's 66, nearly 67 years. Um, it was the early 1950s. It was the time when there were still shortages from World War II and before World War II, of course, there was the depression. I came from a fairly affluent family who would actually come from fairly affluent parents and yet they had been brought up with the concept that you simply do not waste things and you simply do not buy things because there were rarely things to buy. I grew up in a world where you put the milk bottles out and the cream bottles out um, every night. Um, and the boy, as the car drove along the road, the boy would come and actually get the empty ones and put the full ones. Bread was delivered every morning. Um, in time to make the school lunches and it was my brother's job and he always thought that no one ever knew um, that it wasn't a mouse that managed to actually wiggle out half of the fresh bread in one of the loaves but it was his very very small 
fingers. Um, it was a place where the district still had a toy maker. Toys were usually passed on. I think my first bicycle probably had 10 or 15 owners before my father painted it red and gave it to me. But I remember going to the Austrian woodworker who had a toy shop just like in the fairy stories. Um, this absolutely wondrous place that had everything from dolls um, to rocking horses, to trolleys, um, to attachments for bicycles, um, and even wooden bicycles that he'd made with wooden wheels. And you could choose your colors to have them painted and it was complete and utter magic for a child. Every time we went by there in the tram, we would stare. And then suddenly the shop was gone. Um, and now it's um, part of a supermarket complex. It was a world without waste. Um, sometime in the 1950s, the Brisbane City Council decided they would give everyone paper bins, great big paper bins. Now, um, waste bins back then, garbage bins, were less than a metre tall. There were small squat mushrooms and you very rarely had more than about that much in the bottom of them every week. But these bins were massive, absolutely massive ones, because most people would buy two newspapers. Um, the morning newspaper would be delivered, and then on your way home, you would buy the afternoon paper. As the boys yelled, baby, people, there were a lot of newspapers. But of course, newspapers were a valuable item. That was why the city council wanted them, not to turn them back into paper. Um, Fish and chips came in newspaper. Um, mate came in newspaper. First of all, a bit of white paper, then the newspaper. Um, but most of all, of course, every dunny down the backyard had a very, very good supply of newspaper. My mother, with peculiar southern ideas, actually asked at the local shop for toilet paper. And it became a standing joke. It took me about three years to live down. Um, we are a house that actually wanted special paper for well, the dunny and of course what on earth can you read if you don't have a newspaper or a magazine um which was why colored supplements were actually very very small because shiny paper is really no use whatsoever um but those bins were wonderful they were sheer utter magic in a brisbane summer we kids would fill them with water and use them as uh, swimming pools what and always empty them again on the mulberry tree before the garbos you actually had to give the Garbo six bottles of beer um, or else you had very nasty accidents, but we would empty them before the Garbos came. But one day we were having so much fun and we forgot and we saw very shamefaced kids saying, oh, I'm sorry, 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 Mr. Sorry, Mr. to the Garbos. And they laughed and said, oh, you and every other kid in Brisbane, kid, don't worry about it. I don't think there was a single paper bin with a single bit of paper. And to make money for a charity, to make money for an ice block, to make money for lollies, you would go from door to door to door and ask for bottles because of course there was a refund on the bottles and the bottles were reused. There simply wasn't waste, even kitchen waste. Now look, my mum was, I was going to say the worst cook in Brisbane or even possibly Australia, or even possibly um, the worst household manager the world has ever seen. So we actually had quite a lot of kitchen waste. Um, there would never be a meal unless I cooked it, where the potatoes weren't burned or the chops were inedible or the sausages burnt, etc. But look, it didn't matter. We had two dogs. Um, no dog back then would ever dream of eating anything out of a tin. First of all, there weren't any tins of dog food. But for a dog, the joy of sitting there smelling and salivating what everyone was going to eat for dinner, knowing that they were going to have the leftovers with a bit of gravy put on it, and probably even a bit of fruit salad on the side. That's what dogs ate. We also had chooks. Um, for things that even the dogs or the chooks wouldn't eat, which wasn't very much, um, there was down the back. Down the back was usually where people had banana trees um, or avocado trees or some other trees or mango trees. A nice big canopy tree where you just threw everything. You threw lawn clippings, you threw weeds, you threw screwed up bits of paper. Everything really went down the back. When I try and think of what went into our garbage bin, um, I remember there was a dead chook that one of our dogs ate 
And then my mother actually said it was a waste not to eat the chook. The lady next door was actually very upset, so it went in the garbage bin. Um, I think there were probably two or three tin cans, but never anymore, even though my mother loved convenience foods, in other words, spaghetti and baked beans in a can, um, tin cans were valuable. Um, at tin cans, you would turn them into canisters. You would grow cuttings in them. Um, other people in the street would love our tin cans. And of course, every kid had a billy. How on earth did you actually carry the stuff you'd made in cooking at school home if you didn't have your billy? Every piece of cloth was reused and reused and reused. And I was terribly underprivileged as I was the oldest in my generation, had no older cousins or sisters to pass me down dresses. So I had my mother's cast offs. Um, you would take off the top, the bit that was worn with the sweat under the arms, and clothes were remade and remade and remade. And that was my childhood. By the time that was changing, I think probably it was the year Kentucky Fried Chicken came to Brisbane. Um, I was 15, and after an incident where um, I actually smashed an old-fashioned phone against my mother's boyfriend's nose, and I think broke his nose after he tried to rape me. Um, I was kicked out of home. Um, and certainly there was no garbage then. Um, I started years where I basically lived on what other people threw out. Um, certainly not garbage bins. Garbage bins outside restaurants and supermarkets in Brisbane back then went go up go up, go up as they fermented. And um, most waste, of course, was kept for the pigs. And it was still going go up, go up, go up and fermenting. I think any pork that anyone ate back then came from very, very, very drunk pigs. Um, but there were throwaway things. I worked every holidays, um, learning very quickly from the age of 12, I worked in kitchens. You got fed in kitchens. You ate leftovers in kitchens. No, women didn't have equal pay. And certainly um, 15, 16 or even 18 year old girls or even 21 year old women um, did not make enough to live on unless they could go through university and get one of the professions. Um, but I worked in the holidays. I worked at places that fed me. Um, and I also um, lived on her handouts, um, there were several um, fruiterers on the way home. It took me about two hours to walk from school to a place where I finally found a room in a shared house where my father stayed in the odd days. He was in Brisbane, though he didn't really see why he should pay to keep me in school or university, so he never did. Um, there was always food. Um, there was always waste food. There was always bruised food. Um, there were always bruised vegetables that you could eat. And then down here, um, this was still a place where my neighbours had grown up in the Depression. Um, usually their children had moved away to jobs and most of the people around all my neighbours in fact were in their 60s or 70s or even 80s. And the next door neighbour Jean Hobbins had growing up in a time when it wasn't called self-sufficiency. It was just the way you survived in the Depression. Um, she'd fallen in love, I think it was a trombone player, a saxophonist, um, but he lost his job in the Depression. Um, he went to work on the railway across the Nullarbor. She went to cook for them. Um, she kept a chook farm. She'd done all sorts of things, and they had retired down here. And on a block of land no bigger than a suburban back garden. She grew all of her food and enough to sell in town so she could have an overseas holiday once a year. Though there was a paddock for Jackie the cow. I was never really sure whether calling the cow Jackie was a compliment or not. And Jean taught me how to grow things, how to grow absolutely everything from the corn flour and the duck eggs to make the best possible sponge you have ever eaten, um, to actually how to milk the cow, which I knew how to milk by then, but actually how to make proper clotted cream to go on top of the sponge cake, how to grow the raspberries. Jean never went anywhere without a pair of secateurs, um, a lot of old envelopes to put cuttings and seeds in and a very slightly grubby, incredibly large handbag. And she would come back from any CWA 
or see in the citizens um, excursion with more cuttings and more seeds and woe betide me if they were not growing next time June came for visit. Wow. It was poverty. It was poverty as much as choice. I had left what could have been a secure, I was going to say actually what could have been a secure public service job. That's what we thought then. Um, come to think of it, everyone I worked with, I think, has lost their job in the public service since then because it wasn't quite as secure for life as we assumed. But I thought I had left a secure public service job to come down here. It was a choice to live with what back then we called voluntary simplicity. Um, that human beings are born with hands as well as brains, and we need to use both. That if you buy an object, you've only got the object. It's a single-use object. If you make it, or if it is made by someone you know, if it has been made by love, if it has got memories, it becomes such a rich object. Every time I look around this house, there isn't a single object which isn't full. Of memories. Um, I lived in a tent, though it was actually a homemade tent from, um, from old fabric, um, a shed which doesn't look as though it's many colours, but um, because everything was um, either second hand or third hand or reject, um, if you look at in different angles, you will actually see that every side is a different colour, very carefully matched. And then I started to build this place, using stone from the creek, using sand from the creek, um, we, be, we did buy concrete. I think the house costs $3,000 to rock up stage, which is probably the equivalent of about 30,000 now. Um, wait a minute, um, oops, sorry. It's asking me if I want um, two-factor authentication, which I can't do as we don't get mobile phone reception. Um, the only really new expensive thing was the wood stove. That cost $1,000. Um, just about everything else was reject or secondhand. And I know that is difficult these days because um, there are now regulations. You can't use secondhand or thirdhand or fourthhand. I think our tool house is made of corrugated iron, which is probably 10th or 15th hand because back in 1910, they made very, very good corrugated iron, which will last for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. But when I look around here, I can't, oh, there's my bed over there, okay, that, that's relatively new. Um, the sheets are grandmas, um, the tablecloths are great grandmas. The desk I'm sitting at was the first piece of furniture I ever bought, um, four desks for $10, and this is one of them, um, the one that has actually come with me. Um, everything here I've inherited from my grandmother. Um, I've had two vacuum cleaners in my life. The first was the one that grandma was given as a wedding present um, back in the early 1920s. Um, that went, I think, until nearly the year 2000. Um, back then you could repair things. Um, so we've had that vacuum cleaner, the new one now, um, it's probably about 20, 23 years old. The washing machine is 38 years old. Um, it too comes from a time when you can repair things. I've had two irons. Um, in fact, I've still got the two irons. Um, one of them was a wedding present for my husband with his first marriage. Um, the other one is the iron that grandma, again, was given as a wedding present, which I use as a doorstop. Um, the handle is worn out and we got it, we get it repaired. Um, these days, just like my childhood, we live really without garbage. Now, look, we do have some garbage now. Um, sadly, some things come in plastic bottles. Um, sadly, these days I'm on various tablets and unlike the times of my childhood where every chemist had a dispenser and you took the containers back to the... Sorry, it keeps um, muttering at me. Um, you took the containers back again to the dispenser. Um, I now have got little bits of aluminium, but it's not very much. And that is a good thing because since um, our road fell down the hill in the first flood since the, after the bushfires, probably 
never to be made again. It takes us an hour and a half to drive to the nearest place where Palerone Council always allows to put a rubbish bin um, because they won't drive on dirt roads. Um, and even when we get there, um, we find that someone has filled up our garbage bins. They are thinking of a better possible walkable system. So when we drive for an hour and a half, we might possibly have an empty rubbish bin, but it is so much easier not to do that. Um, okay, wombats aren't terribly good at recycling. Um, wallabies are very choosy about what they recycle. So I'm peering out at the wallaby eating the locusts. But again, we've got chooks. Um, I love to cook. Um, the chooks love to eat. What we don't eat, um, the biscuits that go stale, the cake that goes stale, the leftover lasagna, um, it goes to the chooks. They're very, very happy chooks. Um, one of them even lived to be 24 years old, though most of them only live to be about sort of 10, 11 or, or 12. Um, they're extremely happy and well-fed chooks. Um, there is no such thing as garden waste. Um, we consign it to the ecology. We simply throw it under the avocado trees or around the young fruit trees. Um, we've got lyre birds. Um, one lyre bird can turn over 155 tons of soil. Though sometimes cooking at them in my strawberry bed, I think that's probably really underestimating quite how much one lyre bird can move even in an afternoon. Um, we've got soil microbes. Um, put a spade into the soil, which I very, very rarely do, and it's vermicide. You've actually decapitated at least half a dozen worms when you do it. Uh, we had some wonderful volunteers cutting down dead wood um, that had died in the drought and then in the bushfire winds, um, asking where to put it. And I just simply said piled. And look, we are talking piles that are probably two or three metres high of branches, but they're not going to be like that very long. Um, a year or two, particularly if it rains, um, particularly if the lyre birds breed up, and even those quite large logs are going to go back into soil. We've got lyre birds. We did have betongs, we did have bandicoots. I think we might possibly have betongs again because I tripped over one of their nests, um, which is yet another story. Um, all of these small burrowing animals are the ones that helped create soil in Australia. And this is probably actually where I should stop shattering. Um, I think if you have got waste, you need to look at what's wrong in your life. Um, if you've got takeaway food containers, Every time I have gone to the city, well, in fact, for many years, I would long for takeaway food. I didn't actually have to cook. You could just have a menu. But I've never found any that actually tastes any good. I am married to a man who will not go out for dinner or lunch because he can eat better at home or at our friends' places. And he is perfectly correct. Um, our friends cook so much better than just about any cafe or restaurant and certainly takeaway you could have. Are you going on holidays thinking you need a break, you need an escape. Truly, if you need an escape from your life, you need to reorganize and redo your life. I don't want to escape from my life. I just want more of it and more. If you look around you, I remember my grandsons um, when they came to our place um, after an absence of about a year and a half. And first of all, they're rather distrustful because everything grandma has is old and very and a lot of it is actually very slightly tatty. And they have learned to associate old and very slightly tatty with being dirty. Um, quite quickly though, they realize that no, it's not dirty, even though it's tatty. And now they think it's interesting Day after day after day, um, they love actually just sneaking around the house and looking at things because there is absolutely nothing that you don't look at. The ceilings are made of recycled wood, different kinds of recycled wood. They're not featureless. Um, 
the different walls, the different rocks? Is there going to actually be a little bit of gold among the rocks? Because there is, if you look closely. If you look at the carving on the furniture, Grandma was an artist and she had that furniture made and carved exactly as she wants. The toys we've collected, the books we've collected. Um, Grandma's house is so interesting, they say. And I think Grandma rather feels that she's had a very interesting life as well. Are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Jackie, that was incredible. And I love the way you've sketched that historical perspective on waste. And, you know, that waste is sort of this construct, um, partly in our, you know, in our minds and also of our time. So I really appreciate those reflections. I'm interested in picking um, up on. Oh, I was going to actually say, that's, that's the personal waste journey. There is also the scientific waste journey that I read about in New Scientist. Um, I was asked a few weeks ago to actually write about the problem of single use plastic. There is no such thing as single use plastic. Um, there, we are a bright species. We have worked out techniques to actually recycle all plastic. We don't need the methods to do it. We don't need the technology. We have got it. We simply need the social will and the political will. And that's something beyond a personal journey. I want to drive energy efficient vehicles. If I fly, I want energy efficient planes. And that probably means very, very light materials. And it means plastics. Plastics which are not going to break down in sunlight. So the plane falls out of the sky, I hope, um, but will break down in soil to become soil or even fertilizer or even in vats to make new plastics. There are so many solutions. The only real problem, as I said, is the social and political will to put those solutions into practice. Yeah, beautiful. Look, thank you, Jackie. I do have a question for you. Um, it's not actually from our audience. I wanna pick up on something that you talked about earlier around voluntary simplicity. I think that term is beautiful. And I wonder what would be your top tips for people here this evening on if they wanted to embark on a voluntary simplicity journey, what would you say would be, you know, your top three things that they might think about? Never be a tourist. Never ever take anything which is aimed at being a tourist. Um, if you tour, hitchhike. Um, hitchhiking has gone out of fashion. Um, and this probably isn't the time to actually talk about ways to make sure it is very safe hitchhiking, but trust me, there are ways to make sure it is, actually it's fairly safe as long as you don't go through a civil war, but that's another, another, um, that, that, that's another story. Apart, apart from actually being hijacked by vast terrorists, yes, um, it's always been completely safe. Um, Never have something which is single use. Um, accept things given to you with love. Um, make things, um, make do, um, recycle things. Make sure that there is absolutely nothing in your life that actually doesn't have love and memories with it. Um, but if you ever find yourself buying for the sheer love of buying, the whole concept of browsing, the whole concept of shopping, as, as, um, as entertainment, um, there is something deeply and desperately wrong. Um, it really is, um, I think, a sign of deep insecurity that you need to continually give yourself new things, fresh things, so you actually don't have to think about um, something which is deeply wrong. If you ever find yourself buying simply for the sake of buying, if you find yourself browsing, simply for the sake of browsing, go and do something. Um, go and give some life. Find, find a piece of life. Um, grow your own food. Now, look, this is not the time to actually give you a thing on backyard self-sufficiency. But like Jean Hobbins, um, if aliens suddenly picked up this place and, and stuck me in a spacecraft. Um, we could live extremely well for endless generations just on what we have got here, whether it is the solar panels, the hot water panels, the various contraptions that actually Brian has made, the house itself, 
The garden will feed several families for generation after generation. But also when I look out here, I can see an edible landscape created by the Dirka women 20,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. I have no idea. But when you plant something in the right place, you can leave it. It will come back again. I thought I had lost so many fruit trees, avocado trees, oranges in the drought. They were dead, completely dead sticks for four years. Um, the tops of them were decomposing. And now they're trees again, simply coming back. Um, never, ever think of anything as single use. Mm. Um, I think, but I think book. The easiest thing is to make your life interesting. Um, make your life just full of extremely interesting things. Um, and if you find you need to binge on a screen, um, you need to fill yourself with other people's lives, lives which have been carved out, this sh shallow ephemera of, of tourism. Um, Yes, I'm a traveller, but I am a micro traveller. Um, my idea of travelling now is actually having a day or two free um, to wander the valley, and I know it changes every day, and I will never, ever, ever be able to see enough of it. But I travel for work, and that is a glorious way to travel, to travel, to do something, to work with a community, to live with a community, um, to take a temporary job in the community, whether it's a voluntary one or whether it is a paid one. Um, don't go for a 10 day escape to a resort. Um, go for three months, go for six months, go for a year. Again, I'm going back to my childhood where people traveled, but it was expensive. And so when you went to Europe, you went for a year and you worked. And in that year, you got enough money to come home again. Um, or else you had even more adventures and you bought a bicycle um, and you travelled through Europe and Asia on the bicycle, which, um, again, is yet another story. Beautiful. Look, I do have a question from the audience for you, mm -hmm. Jackie. And it's a um, question about how do you manage the good intentioned friends and family that gift and bring waste into your life without coming across as righteous or mean-spirited? Never, ever refuse anything which is made or given with love. Um, always accept it, and particularly if it has been made with love, keep it, um, including the anatomically correct dragon, which I have actually got outside made for me by a 10-year-old boy. Um, always accept things given with love. Um, if they haven't been made with love, if they've just been bought because they think they need to give you a gift, most of the gifts people bring us go to the chooks. Thank you for that lovely cake you have actually bought at the bakery. Doesn't it look absolutely delicious? Isn't it wonderful? Um, yes, um, it does. It does tend to go to the chooks. Um, please don't give us meringues because the chooks don't, don't like meringues at all. Um, other things um, we give away. Um, it's called museums um, and art galleries call it deaccession. And that is very much what Brian and I are doing now. We are trying to ask people, please don't give us birthday or Christmas presents. Um, don't give us gifts when you come down. Don't give us anything just because you think you need to give us something. Please, next time I go to a school. Um, Please, I would love a handmade card signed by the kids. I would love a paper mache wombat. Um, but I don't want a gift that's actually been bought and that you have spent money on because then I'll have to try and find someone who would like it. And luckily, there are all we recommend give it as a place for that. When you are in the deaccessioning de stage of life, Give it is wonderful because they will, if you've got um, six spare tea towels, um, 24 um, souvenir mugs, um, a glorious tablecloth or, or yet another um, 60 gallons of, of tea leaves, um, there is sure to be a family who would absolutely love them and need them. 
Fantastic, Jackie. And like lovely, wonderful advice to, you know, bring that positivity to gift giving, you know, that you can re-gift, give it on, you know, and that graciousness. Um, I'm really interested, you know, I, I love what you said about don't bring anything into your life without love and memories, you know, nothing as, don't have anything as single use and make every day interesting. I mean, they're wonderful. I should, have, I should have also added a very practical thing to that is that when your jumper wears out, um, don't try and compost it if it's made of wool. I actually dug up 40 year old compost and still found a natural wool jumper and beanie, which was perfectly good, which I tossed out accidentally into it. Um, give it a good wash and in wool wash and it was absolutely fine. But when you buy clothes, and I have to say about 10 years ago, I was taken in hand by HarperCollins um, that secondhand clothes um, I needed to cultivate a look which was not um, quite the look um, I, had, I had had. Um, they also took me to a hairdresser and showed me the value of lipstick, um, but feel, um, feel the quality of it. Um, and be aware of starch. Starch is a wonderful way that cheap linen, cheap cotton, et cetera, can look as though it is good quality. Grandma would never go and buy a sheet or a tea towel without feeling the quality of the cloth and that's why her sheets and great grandma's sheets and their damask dinner napkins are still in use in our household now and I rather hope um, someone will take them on um, after I am gone. These are things which last for generations. Um, in the middle ages um, wealthy aristocratic families would pride themselves on never buying anything. They would be given gifts from the king of bolts of cloth, but mostly dresses would be remade and remade and remade for, for generations, and you would grow things on the estate. It was regarded as terribly middle class to ever, ever have to buy something. That's amazing. Um, I'm, I am actually really uh, interested in this question about how do you have time to do this stuff? You know, I feel. Like, um, it lasts. It could, how long do you spend every week in a supermarket? How long do you spend browsing for clothes? How long do you spend shopping? Um, if you've got a pair of shoes, which is actually going to last for the rest of your life. Um, if you've got a handbag, which is going to last for at least two or three decades. Um, just remember to use a good beeswax waterproof polish on it. Um, things were polished for a reason. If you have bought clothes, um, this is my zooming dress. Um, after the Zoom is over, it will be very, very carefully taken off and put on a hanger and only put on again when I Zoom again. Um, these are my professional clothes, but um, this, well, with HarperCollins advice, I do have a very small wardrobe of very, very good clothes, and these are going to last me for the rest of my life, unless fashion changes absolutely drastically, which it probably will in a decade or so, and I'll need to go shopping again. Um, but having time, no, on the contrary, um, time is something, I was going to say that I'm rich in, but I'm not, but I'm not rich in time for all sorts of other reasons. But growing my own food, um, darning, um, all of the other things, um, taking um, what we had last night and turning the leftovers in, into cottage pie or into a quiche or what have you. Um, cooking, when I read a cookbook, it's for inspiration. It's not for a recipe. We cook depending on what is available, either what is fresh in the market or um, that is growing here and, and we adapt. Um, it's not time poor. It has to be very time rich. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. I've just got one last question from Libby in our audience. Oh. And she's got a question about writing. So do you think there are enough children's books that tackle environmental issues or is this a topic that writers avoid? I've no idea. Um, I'm not. Um, I write books for kids and for adults, but I'm not an expert in the children's literature that is around. Um, 
I think you could probably call my um, writing, though, um, recycling. Um, my books are all based on history or stories I have been told or real things. They're the ultimate in recycling. I think we have got far too many, though, depressing environmental books. If I see one more alphabet of extinct animals that we are reading to poor, helpless two-year-olds. Um, sorry, dear, here is this beautiful animal, but you will never see it again. Um, the ABC of extinction. The one thing we must do for our kids is give them optimistic books and books that give them courage and resilience and confidence. And I don't think they necessarily need an environmental theme. It's one of the reasons I write historical books for kids. We are descended from the survivors. We are descended from those who survived ice age, volcanic eruptions, um, plagues. We are descended from people who were either warriors or good at running and hiding or good at smiling and saying, um, we don't speak each other's language, but if we cooperate, we might escape from the volcano that's exploding over there. We're descended from survivors and that is what we need to give our kids. They will see the stories of climate change, environment, environmental degradation. Um, one of my grandsons, um, was talking to me, he's four, about the murderers of turtles who use plastic bags, did I know? Um, we don't need more kids' books that talk about that. We need to give kids books that make them love this planet, um, that give them confidence in humanity. Get kids to love the world and they will work to save it. Beautiful. Look, thank you, Jackie. And I feel like that's a really nice note to sort of wrap things up for you. I want to ask you one final tip. If you if people could do just one practical thing or one change one way of thinking, what would be your one thing you would leave people with? The one change in mindset to get them on that. 90% 90, 90 of the microplastics in our oceans come from the artificial fibres um, in the clothes just when we wash them, not even when we throw them away, but simply by washing them. Um, please don't do that. Yeah, beautiful. All right. One really simple thing people can do, buy clothing that doesn't have microplastics. Yeah? Yes. Um, yes. Um, clothing cloth and clothing, which is actually going to last. Um, but yes, find out what your clothes are made of. And even some um, cotton clothes um, may be treated with um, various, um, various products um, to stop odors building up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, find out what you are wearing. Um, but that becomes much easier if you assume you're going to be wearing it for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. And by the way, um, I would really love to have social permission to wear um, a great grandma's mink jacket. It is absolutely beautiful and it has been dead for over a hundred years and it is still the warmest thing I have ever, ever worn and I would never, ever, ever want a mink killed, but I would really love to be able to wear her jacket in public. Yeah, wow. Thank you, Jackie. Look, that's a great um, closing tip for everyone and I feel like you've taken um, us on this. Wear a mink jacket. No, not the pink jacket. But be intentional about the clothing that you wear and, you know, and choose, choose wisely for something that will last. Um, absolutely beautiful. I love the journey you've taken us on from the 1950s, you know, through this voluntary simplicity part of your life and all these principles about nothing in life without love and memories, you know, nothing in your life that's single use and to really make life interesting you know, be interested in, and curious about your world. Look, it's been I our real pleasure to have you. Could, could I add? Yes, you um, can. 30, one, one 30 second thing is to actually have confidence yourself. I can't hammer a nail straight, but I can build a stone wall. If I can do it, I'm a terrible gardener. It's why I'm a good gardening writer, because I make so many mistakes and kill so many things. Um, if I can do it, anyone can do it 
Beautiful. Thank you. And look, it's been so fantastic to have you headlining our festival, Jackie. Um, we really appreciated your time and we've loved the way you've taken us on a journey and reshaped the way we think about waste and about our own lives. Um, for people who've been with us this evening, if you've been inspired by this and you want more, um, Jackie will be one of our panellists on our next panel, the Zero Waste Journey panel, which is starting in about 15 minutes time at 8pm. And then tomorrow, as part of the Zero Waste Festival, we also have a series of six, five, sorry, masterclasses, two in the middle of the day and three in the evening. So jump on our website, register. It's absolutely free to register. And we would love to see you for more of these events at the festival. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.